Welcome to the geek to geek podcast where we are bookworms, if you didn't know already. I'm Void, and I'm here with my co-host, Beige. I'm not a teacher anymore. Yes, this is true, and we will get into that later, but there's some spoiler news right up front. Today, we're talking about uh, reading, but kind of like reading in the digital age. Like, we're yeah. all surrounded by technology right now, so we realized that we wanted to get a lot of things out there for season one, just kind of so you guys get to know us, and then we can maybe do deeper dives later, and we haven't yeah. really talked about reading uh, we talked about the whole indie author thing early on with you, which was awesome. But yep. And then we talked about comic books, but that was early on also. Um, and then we never really got back around to just doing, like, reading books and novels and stuff. So that's that's what we want to talk about quick today. And then we both have a ton of geekery. So we're actually going to try yeah. to make our main topic a little bit shorter and uh, get to the geekery. So we should get into it. Um, the main thing, like, how do we read? When do we read? How about uh, you? Okay, I read exclusively on kindle now i can't remember the last time i read a paper book books for me are kind of like you in video games where i do not waste the space or the time or the money on a physical book because it's uncomfortable for me to read i don't i can't do it in the dark i just i can't get it whenever i think oh i'd like to read this book i don't have it in 15 seconds so exclusively kindle because that is they have the best devices and i pretty much read before bed i've i've gotten to the point where i don't make time during the day because during the day is either work or exercise or some sort of tv so that i can get that kind of narrative going but i tend to read right before bed i have a kindle paper white and I read on it in the dark while Jennifer's going to sleep where I don't have to keep a light on to bother her. I don't have to worry about being in an uncomfortable position. I can do it pretty much anywhere, anytime that I want with the paper white or the app on my phone that I've purged pretty much every paper book. I sell them at yard sales. I just get rid of everything but the ones that I absolutely hold dear to me that I would hug if that I would run back into a house if my house were on fire to get those books. Uh, but other than that, it's all digital. Yeah, and I'm basically in the same spot. Um, I've slowly purged my collection. I used to have bookshelves and bookshelves full of books. And yep. then I moved a couple times and had tubs and <laughs> yes. tubs. Yeah, tubs and tubs of books, like giant storage tubs full of them and um just through the process of moving and then having kids and having a house where like space is we're, we're not uh -huh. super constrained for space but we're in a townhouse right we're not in like a giant sprawling mega complex yeah. house we don't have a mansion or anything so we've purged our just all of our possessions many times just get yep. rid of stuff get rid of stuff get it out of here you know make more space and uh -huh. in doing that the only books i have left that are physical copies um i have my old star wars expanded universe collection because yes. i still hold it dear and it's kind of like it, there was a good breaking point there because disney came in and reset the extended universe the expanded yeah. universe whatever you want to call it um and so all of the new expanded universe stuff I have digitally, but all the old stuff, I still have my physical copies and I don't want to get okay, rid of those. Yep. And then the only other paper books that I still have, I have um, a signed copy of Old Man's War by John Scalzi. Awesome. I'm going to steal that from you. Well, I, I, I got it. it personally signed by him when I went to a signing when I was at a nerd. Ah. Yeah, I went to NerdCon Stories last year and oh. um, just because it was in town where I live. You know, it's in right. Minneapolis and I live outside the Twin Cities, so it's perfect. At that same convention, I also got my original copy of Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss signed by Patrick awesome. Rothfuss. Awesome. So those are the only other two physical books that I have left are the ones signed by the authors from two of my favorite authors, two of my favorite series ever. Everything else, I'm digital now. So I kind of do the same thing as you. Um, it depends on the book. If, if I'm reading something I'm really into, I won't just read at night. I will read during the day. I will read during mm. every free period I have. I'll read when I'm out and about. Um, if I have a book that I'm just kind of picking away at, I'm more like you. I'll read it at night right before bed a little bit. Um, but I've had a couple books lately like Paper and Fire or like Ink and Bone. And um, now I'm into The Blood Mirror, which is the latest. Right. Yeah. In Brent Week series that you talked about last week. And all of these I've been reading a lot. So the thing is, I read probably 95% of the time on my phone. And yeah. I use the Kindle app. So all of my books that I get digitally are Kindle. And I actually use WhisperSync, which you told me you've almost never used. I've never used because I keep, since I read mostly on the paper white, 
I don't keep the wireless on it. So whenever I'm reading, I don't want to run the battery down and worry about the battery since I'm already in bed in the dark when I'm grabbing it. So I tend not to keep the wireless on. And so it won't whisper sync wherever I'm at. So I just don't even bother with switching back and forth between the same book. I either buy the audiobook or I buy the ebook. I rarely buy both unless it's just a dollar or two. And see, a lot of the time I will grab both if it's a book that I really want to get through or that I'm really enjoying or I know I will want to come back to and listen to again later. Yeah. Because um, if you guys don't know, a lot of the time when you like add a Kindle book to your cart on Amazon, there's a little button right underneath that before you like add it all the way to the cart. It's when you're on the page for the book. And there's Mm -hmm. a thing that says add audible narration. And a lot of the times you can get it from like somewhere in the two to five dollar range mm-hmm. instead of going and buying a whole audiobook for like forty dollars or if you have an audible subscription buying it for you know one credit or whatever you can just get it for a couple bucks so i will do that often and i will read mostly on my phone and then when i'm doing other stuff i'll be listening to the audiobook and they sync up to whatever spot i left off which is perfect yep. that's what i'm doing for blood mirror right now and it works great i've actually meant to ask you about this because I've had it, well, it's not that I've had it, it's how does it know the exact spot you're at? I'm assuming that it's a general area where you might get a few paragraphs that you've heard, you've read before when it does the whisper sync, just based on the way it does pages. No, um, it actually tracks it down to the word. So if you, it's harder if you have it on like some kind of screen, because if you have it on a Kindle, you have a lot of words on one page, right? Yeah. So it'll kind of hold your your place at the top of that page. Um, okay. Whereas like when I'm reading on my phone, there's less words on the page, so it's closer. And when I'm right. listening on, when I'm listening on Audible, wherever you stop, it will pick up at the exact word you paused it at. So WhisperSync okay. actually seems to track it down to the exact word. It just kind of depends on your page size and your font size if you're reading it. Yeah. Yeah, but um, so 95% of the time it's on my phone, but I also will get out my Kindle sometimes if I go outside or if I want to just sit and dedicate time to reading for hours on end, which I don't usually have time for. Um, And then occasionally I'll just be sitting somewhere with my iPad and I want to read on that. So I have my Kindle app on there that, you know, whisper right. sync, it gets you to the same spot. So it doesn't matter whatever device I have in front of me. I can kind of read on anything. And the other thing that I wanted to mention, because when I tell people I read on my phone, they're like, isn't that <laughs> uncomfortable? And it's really not. I mean, especially if you have a more modern phone that's a little bit bigger, like I have a a 6 right now, iPhone 6, um, which isn't gigantic, but it's not small either. I I used to, yeah, I used to read paper books, or not paper books, I used to read uh, Kindle on my iPhone 4S also, and that was just fine also. It was fine, but once I upgraded to the 4.7 inch screen with the uh, Nexus, uh, the Nexus 4 was the first 4.7 I had, and it just became better quality of life to read. The difference in a 4 inch and a 4.7 inch screen for like text like this with the app, especially using night mode, became just just exponentially better for me as a as a reader yeah and that's the one thing i wanted to mention before we move on is that to read on my phone all this time um the key to it is using uh, i guess it's not called night mode but you basically set it up as a night mode do a black background and then they give you text options and there's a couple different like light grays that you can use so you don't want you don't want the typical black text on a white screen. That will cause eye strain over time. Oh, it hurts so bad after just a very little bit. Especially if you're reading in bed at night in the dark, which is usually where I'm reading. Um, uh-huh. That will kill your eyes very fast. It hurts. Don't do that. Use the black background and then don't do pure white text on top mm-hmm. of it, which you can set it up that way, but don't. Set it up to <laughs> just slightly off of white. There's some grays that are very close to it. And that is my preferred reading experience. I absolutely love reading on my phone with the black background the light gray text it's it's like the perfect way to read for me these days yeah i did the same thing i found out that the white text just had too much contrast for the night and it gave the same kind of eye strain that white that black on white did so i when i switched it to gray it was just almost as easy to read as the paper white is and what i like about the paper white is that there's pretty much no eye strain because it's just a very light gray light coming out of it and so it just kind of looks like a dimly lit paperback yeah exactly i i don't know i really like reading with that setting with the black background yeah um, but we kind of touched on like audiobooks so listening to audiobooks because you don't use whisper sync 
Um, right. You've told me that you actually listen to totally different types of books, right? I do. When my when I'm listening to audiobooks, I'm generally listening to nonfiction. I have a really hard time these days of listening to fiction on audiobook. I don't know what it is. I I don't like reading nonfiction. That when I'm sitting down for something, I'm taking that time. That's my escapism time. My nonfiction tends to be more article based, where I'm reading something on the internet. I'm finding something on Flipboard. I'm finding anything on that I can share with people. Uh, it's a magazine like Runner's World when I'm reading uh, nonfiction like that. But when I'm listening to audio, I listen to memoir. I listen to, I don't really listen to biography that often, but memoir a lot. I listen to a lot of kind of collections. People will make fun of me because it's like chicken soup for the runner's soul. Things like that that I really like. Just very short vignettes about something. I'll listen to um, things like Bart Yasso's My Life on the Run. Um, I've listened to, you know, the magical art of tidying up just just things like that my nonfiction, 10 percent happier was an audiobook i really like that as i'm going out it feels as though i'm i like learning things while i'm on the move it's like how my brain tends to work a little bit more i or just how my brain tends to work that i will when i'm listening i absorb that information better and it's kind of of just I don't even know what how to put it, but when I'm reading a a novel or listening to a novel on audiobook, it's almost like I lose myself so much that I zone out and I miss part of the novel, and I don't necessarily do that with nonfiction. And see, I like nonfiction when I'm listening to when I'm out and about, but I never actually listen to nonfiction books. I listen to right. podcasts for that. Ah, so like that's where I get a ton of like I, I listen to a lot of gaming podcasts, but I listen to a ton of other ones also. So like hardcore history is one of the greatest podcasts out there. And if you're not listening to it, you should be listening to it. It's Dan I Carlin. Need to. I yeah, it's called Hardcore History. Like, that's what I would turn to in the situations you're talking about, because yeah. I really love podcasts, if you haven't been able to tell yet. And, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, and, like, things like Hardcore History, there are a ton of other, like, real-world nonfiction podcasts out there mm -hmm. that are great, too. So I will listen to some of those also. Um, but when I'm actually listening to, like, Audible and audiobooks on the go... I listen to the exact same types of books that I read, and a lot of the mm. time I'm listening to the exact same book that I am reading. Like I said, like right now, The Blood Mirror, I'm yeah. listening to it and I'm reading it. So I can kind of like increase the speed that I'm getting through it because I'm really into the story, you know? Yeah. So when I'm doing stuff around the house, when I'm making the kids dinner or I'm washing the dishes or, you know, not washing the dishes, but right. loading the dishwasher, stuff like that, you know, <laughs> just like all That's of washing this, the dishes. Yeah. Just all of this like household maintenance adulting that you have to do. Like, yeah, you can't read during that. You can't play a video game during that. So I feel that kind of stuff with podcasts and audiobooks. But yeah, the audiobooks, I, I do the same exact type of audio books that I do when I'm sitting down to read. And I tend to do the same kind of podcast that you do. I really have not listened to a lot of of gaming podcasts lately, a lot of the geek podcasts like I did, that whenever I turn to podcasts, it's generally one of the almost uh I don't even, I don't like calling them self help, but it's it's kind of the uh the the intellectual or just kind of making your day better kind of podcast like happier with Gretchen Rubin 10% happier with Dan Harris stuff like that where I'm listening to these professionals in various fields and the interviews like that that always get impart some kind of advice that I can listen to and then take into my own life that I've it's actually made listening to stuff like that has actually made my marriage better by listening to some of those podcasts and just kind of reflecting on myself and being like Oh yeah, that that's what this person did. It's like I can do that. That's like my exact situation. So those are the kinds of podcasts that I listen to. Not necessarily like hardcore history nonfiction, but the uh, the kind that that make me reflect on myself. I really like that because I'm like mega either self absorbed or self reflective, whichever way you want to put it. I think you're more self reflective, but um, I don't want to give the impression that's the only kind of podcast I listen to because I listen. I ha I'm subscribed to like 50 last time I counted. I'm probably closer oh, to 60 now, and I listen to every episode. Like um, these are ones that I'm actively listening to every single week. Some of them are every two weeks or so, but you know I probably get a good 40 podcasts every week in my feed, if not more. 
and I listen to all of them. So I listen to tons of gaming ones and geeky ones, and then I listen to some that are nonfiction like that. I, I have a good mix that I like. And like even nonfiction, I've been listening to the 538 election podcast, and it's been making me feel better about the election because it's it's not partisan one way or another because I never – I don't like to get deep into part, partisan politics. It just yeah. makes me angry and frustrates me. But – um, the 538 election podcast is just all about the statistics. And I find it, oh my gosh, it's so interesting to dive deep into stats. I've always found stats kind of interesting ever since the first stats class I took when I really yeah. didn't want to take it and I had to. And by the end of that, I was like, oh, this applies to like everything in life. Like stats are so important. And now I do things yes. like I do analytics for, you know, like digital marketing. So all of yep. these stats things that I always liked, I get to do them to some extent now, which is cool. But the 538 Elections podcast is all about like uh, the polls and the stats and the model that they use. And it's not about the partisan politics that I hate. You know, it's, it's yeah. about the interesting like kind of just stat part of it. So that's cool. See, and even with that, I don't think I would be able to listen to 538 because I get so... I take everything and then extrapolate it, which is a personal issue that I have and look kind of down the road rather than what's directly in front of me. So even when I listen to statistics, I'm looking forward and applying those kind of sociologically to people. And then that makes me go into that slippery slope fallacy end of, well, this is what's going to end up happening. But what if this happens? And I know that it's illogical. I know as an English teacher that that is not how how it works because I have to deal with argument all the time but that's how my brain immediately goes with politics so even with it being stats based I couldn't listen to that podcast yeah yeah and I don't want to get too into politics here but oh right um, right but but no I, I can see that perspective of it I just like it for like the math part of it and the stats and the model and like all of that stuff is super fascinating to me oh yeah but anyway, that kind of thing that's is kind of like our, our non-fiction area I know you want to talk a little bit about fiction and like the draw of like sci-fi fantasy because i think that's mostly what both you and i read yeah pretty much i whenever i'm reading it's sci-fi and fantasy uh there is very rarely anything else that i read i will read and i don't know about you i know that you don't tend to read anything in the real world that you use it really as a, a sci-fi and fantasy as an escapist uh kind of fiction escapist yeah, mechanism yeah, sure. to to get out of the real world and i'm not so much like that i tend to just like those settings more that if there's a really good real world setting like like i said i really like memoir and things like that so i can i don't care about that uh the setting too much i care about the characters and i care about it being i guess it's the english major in me being really cliched and formulaic that even if it's sci-fi and it's really formulaic that's that's going to turn me off immediately even if everybody tells me it's just wonderful if i get you know 30 pages in and i'm like oh this is kind of like you in gamefly games it's like i can tell what this is going to be yeah. i just put it down yeah i can fantasy see that. that's the reason that i got really tired because i read so much fantasy as a as a child and as a teenager that i am completely burned out on traditional high fantasy that i can't even go and read tolkien anymore because it is so high fantasy that I'm put off by it, which is why I don't like the Final Fantasy XIV text, that it feels like it's trying so hard to be high fantasy that I just can't do it. That That's why I love the Patrick Rothfuss, book, Rothfuss books, because I they're not traditional high fantasy. They did something new with it. So that's what I'm always looking for, something that pushes what sci-fi or fantasy is and can be. That's why I like John Scott and Pat Rothfuss. That's why I really, really like the uh, Leviathan Wake series, The Expanse, because they take sci-fi and kind of rein it in and mix it more with hard sci-fi to where you actually have math that works. So I like real world stuff. I'll read a mystery. I'll read a detective novel, but it has to be something that the character is interesting rather than just being a cozy mystery or a murder mystery. It's like, oh, this is a formula. I don't care. Yeah, and I will, you're right, I, I don't really like real world setting. The closest I'll get to it is like, um, what would it be called? Like urban fantasy type of stuff. Right, like, like uh, Dresden the, Files Dresden stuff. Files, yeah, Dresden yeah. Files or like uh, the Weather Warden series by Rachel Kane is really good. I, I like heard that one so. a lot. I haven't read it. Yeah, I think I mentioned it the other week when I was talking about Ink and Bone. It's the same author. Okay. Um, 
yeah so if if there's like superpowers or like sci-fi in close to a modern setting i'm okay mm. with it but when it's just straight up the real world like i those books i can't read at all i just get so bored and so frustrated and i want to escape into my fiction like right. i don't want to pick up a book and be transported to somewhere that i could actually go in real life like it feels like a waste of my time in some something in my brain clicks like that i'm like this is dumb and i know it's not i know people like it i know the yeah. reasons but like for me it's just you know if i if i want to experience things in the real world i should just go do them instead of sitting here reading about them it's something along those lines but yeah i i really like sci-fi and fantasy um less fantasy now just because you're right so much of it is so tropey and it gets boring yeah. but i like it when they take like fantasy and twisted or they have a unique yeah. setting that's kind of fantasy but it's not high fantasy so mm -hmm. sanderson has a couple different novels that are like that right you know he, he is pretty much the only fantasy writer that i read now just because every book that he's going to put out is going to be a different kind of fantasy yes. than the tolkien-esque orcs and elves right every sanderson brandon sanderson if you don't know um Every one of his fantasy books has a very unique setting. Ooh, very unique. That's not good English. It has a unique setting. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, it can't be very unique. There's only one one of a kind for unique. You can't. Yeah, I know that from Toby Ziegler. Um, but <laughs> Sanderson has unique settings for all of his fantasy novels. And I just I like it for that reason, right. because it's not the traditional fantasy thing. But yeah, I, I like sci-fi. I like fantasy. That's most of what I read. Something along well, those lines. I'm curious lines. about that. I am curious because one of the things I really like with sci-fi is near future speculative fiction. Yes, I do that, like that. OK, so I didn't know because it is real world, but and I, but I didn't know if it was too close to the real world because it's, you know, just kind of alternate history, like alternate future speculation kind of stuff. Yeah. And and like, what about like techno thrillers? Like not like and there's Michael Crichton that everybody knows with Jurassic Park and things like that. But what about stuff like Reemdy, if you've read it by Neil Stevenson, mm, where no, it's like about. Oh, it's fantastic. Like I, here, here is my, my pitch for Reemdy. It is about gold farming and using I'm MMOs. Bored. <laughs> MMOs and it's using MMOs and gold farming as a way for money laundering. And it's it is awesome awesome like it's what made me write legacy or it's what made me write lineage because this guy created the entire mmo world in it and it made me want to be so creative and it went and wrote my second novel right after finishing that it sounds like it's set in the real world though it is it's set completely in the real world yeah i don't want to read that i'm okay Thanks. even though you love gaming so much no it doesn't matter huh See, I figured you would like something like that because of your main interest. No, if it were set within the game and the game was unique and it's something that we've totally never seen before and it's more about being inside the game, then, then you have there, my interest. There is that. About a third to uh, half of the book is set inside the game with them controlling the characters and it's basically a war inside the game for gold farmers versus these players and then you have the creator of the game and this band of people worrying about the money laundering on the outside and then the outside is the creators of the game uh basically going against the the asian and russian gold farming like farms and the people who are over that and like organized crime so it kind of splits back and forth between you getting to see the interactions and how the real world affects the game world and the game world affects the real world yeah um now you have like half my interest but if half of it <laughs> If half of it is just in the real world, then I'm still kind of like, eh, not really. I mean, those are the more the, boring parts. That is the part that I trudge through more to get back to the cool, like magic fighting and stuff like yeah. that. Kind of like yeah. Re Ready Player One. But but things like that are um, near future, those interest yeah. me. Like um, The Martian was probably yeah. one of my favorite books of the last like five years. I love The Martian as a book and then as an audiobook it's like a totally different experience and then the movie is totally different yeah. too so it's the three forms of it i love all of them for different reasons and but they all they all do feel very different I, do. I am right there with you but i love that book and that's that's near future you know it's yeah. not that far away it's not that different from the technology that we have right now i mean the, they take a little bit of liberties to get the people on mars and right. stay there in the terms of technology but nothing really crazy mm -hmm, and crazy. i like yeah i like things like that because it's still it's not the real world you know it's far enough away that it's not and then what's the other one that i read recently um seven eves seven eves yeah oh it's awesome oh seven, my goodness yeah, seven eves basically starts out in the real world with slight 
slightly future technology, but barely, just barely future technology. Barely, yeah. And, um, but it, it goes forward in time fast enough that you're very quickly into future tech and then very quickly into dealing with the fallout for things that happen in the world. Basically, this isn't really a spoiler. It happens in like the first chapter of the book. The moon breaks apart. The first sentence. Yeah. The moon shatters and then um, they realize that all these pieces of the moon are going to start hitting each other and then rain down on the earth and destroy the earth. So yep. basically they have a couple years worth of time before this happens and they have to find a way to get enough people off the planet and survive long enough that the earth will become habitable again and then get back down to it. So it starts in like almost present day and then it quickly gets beyond that. But books like that, I'm okay with too. I just, I okay. don't like hanging out in the real world for very long in a book. You got to get somewhere else for me to get interested. And, and I completely understand that. That's that is I kind of used to be that way where I would not read it at all. And then I found really good books that did do that, that got me into the real world that I like. Well, and now keep in mind, like I can go back in time too. like if it's something that's historical or like um, historical fiction or sometimes sometimes historical nonfiction, that can interest me also because it's not where we are right now. If it's a time I can't go back to an experience on my own. That's yeah. interesting to me, too. It's just when your setting is like modern day, it's it feels pointless to me to spend my time there when I'm already spending my time here all the time, See, like against my I will. Don't I don't like history books. I don't like alternate history books that much. Um, I'll read some of them, like Man in the High Castle, but not not many of them. I don't particularly care for alternate history. Or, or even ra even historical fiction. I'm just like, nah, I don't care about this. It totally depends on the book. But yeah, I mean, uh, that's kind of where my tastes lie in general. And I wanted to read, with talking about 70s, I went and looked at the very first sentence of the book because it's one of my favorite opening lines ever. And so for those of you who are, who have li who are interested by the idea of what Void was talking about, the very first line is the moon blew up without warning and for no apparent reason. Yes. And for me, that's like... I read the entire book based on that sentence. Yeah, basically me too. It was it was good. It was worth reading through. But yeah, so the other thing that both of us read, and you more than me, I would say, are comics. And um, we didn't want to get too deep into this because we did a whole right. episode about it. And it's actually, we will admit this just based on our stats, it is the least listened to episode of our entire podcast ever. Yep. Um, I, I look at the stats at least once a week and just kind of see how all the episodes are doing and see how the community is growing. And it, mm -hmm. it always makes me happy that our community is slowly growing over time. Um, we're organically getting more people that listen and more people that interact. And it's fantastic. But I do like to look back and see what are the episodes that like most people just haven't heard. And comics is literally the worst performing episode that we ever created <laughs> ever did. Yep. You guys just did not like our take on comics at all nope so if you haven't i suggest go back and listen to it it's like episode four or five it's way back by the beginning it's number five and oh my goodness i'm looking at it right now and it is significantly worse than all the others oh i told you it's not even close but yeah uh -uh. if you want to hear like our history with comics and what we like and what we don't like go go listen to that episode because i know you probably haven't um <laughs> yeah so the only thing that i really wanted to say about comics is that um the Marvel Unlimited service is really good. If you ever oh, want so good. to try to do a deep dive into comics and you haven't and you don't want to spend a lot of money, just pick up like a month or two of Marvel Unlimited. It's it's kind of like a Netflix for comics, but it's only Marvel. But Marvel has mm -hmm. this huge catalog. So you have a ton of choice. It's fantastic. The other thing is I wanted to mention the two comics that I'm actually actively subscribed to on Comixology that I get right. like every single issue that comes out. I just it automatically buys it and delivers it to me digitally. Um, I get Wayward right now which is yeah. it's like um japanese folklore like yokai and ghosts and things like that but they're in the real world and suddenly there's a group of kids not kids like teenagers into early adults who start getting these powers and they start becoming basically like new yokai and then the old ones start losing their powers so it becomes this oh. war this like cultural war that's going on behind the scenes in japan and throughout it you learn so much about like japan and its culture at the end of every issue there's an essay by a writer that's all about japanese culture and it ties into what you just read in that issue so that's awesome if they introduce a new faction or a new person or if something offhand 
repeatedly happens that's just part of Japanese culture. There's like a two page essay in the end of the issue all about it. And I love it for that like essay. Like I would just I would pay the money just to get the essays alone. The comic book is almost like a bonus on top of it. (laughs) But I I love the cultural essays. And now they've gone over into um, some of it kind of bridges the gap between Japan and Ireland with there are story conceits but now they're starting to write essays about Ireland too and like Irish folklore and so it's it's really fascinating for me to just see these essays every time the other one I'm subscribed to right now is Rat Queens which have you read Rat Queens at all I read the first issue of Rat Queens Uh, it's good like it's one that if it were part of Marvel and getting the Marvel Unlimited I would definitely be reading Rat Queens yeah I think Rat Queens is image comics so it's not on DC or Marvel services but it is on comiXology because they have pretty much everything and Wayward is IDW am I right maybe it might be image comics also it might be image okay I just it just shows up and I just read it I don't know um (laughs) But Rat Queens is like, it's like an adult version of D&D, and the party is all women. So it's like violence and sex, but done in a very, it's a it's a way that fits the setting that they've created, right? It doesn't it feel... It doesn't gr- seem, yeah, it doesn't seem exploitative. It doesn't seem exploitative. It doesn't seem gratuitous for no reason, which I always hate. It just kind of fits the narrative that they're telling. Like, sex is in there, violence is in there, but it feels like it fits, and right. it's just kind of like a D&D adventure that's starring all women. And it's it's just really well done. So I like Rat Queens a lot. I get that one every time it comes out, too. And I am I pretty much read back issues. I don't have any that I subscribe to because I'll go every so often and subscribe to Marvel Unlimited when they have a sale and get a free month and then just catch up on all the ones that I've missed. The only thing that I ever really buy is just straight out on its own and I don't buy it as it comes out is that my wife and I are huge fans of the Kamala Khan Ms. Marvel. So every time there's a new trade for it, we get the trade and read through it and just love it. We may end up picking up because she's a major character in Champions now and uh, what's the other one? The all new all different Avengers I believe that she's one of the characters before they broke off it spun off into Champions that we need to pick up the trades for it because we pretty much just love Kamala Khan because she's our kind of weird and like she's a super weird superhero have you read any of those yet I have yeah the last time I picked up comic or not comicsology um Marvel Unlimited I read through basically all of the Kamala Khan series it's really good you're right it is really good like that's the only one I really keep up with and it's because just like I said with sci-fi and fantasy it has to be a character that I love I recently read the Renew Your Vows Spider-Man like Spider-Man line that they did as a part of Secret War and I loved it because I like Peter I I love Spider-Man don't get me wrong but Peter Parker is the reason that I read Spider-Man comics yeah and if you want to hear more about any of that seriously go listen to the comics episode I think we did it like right as I was coming off of my latest um, Marvel Unlimited binge so we had a lot to talk about okay so we wanted to mention some of our favorite authors and books and series and we realized there were two ways we could go about this we could either (laughs) we could either spend like multiple entire episodes talking about these or we could burn down this list super fast and then leave it up to you guys if you want to hear more we have a q a episode coming up in like two three weeks and when by the time you're hearing this so send us any questions you have about these authors or books or series in particular and we will dive deeper because we're just going to burn down this list really quick and then get on to our weekly geekery because we have a bunch we want to talk about this week so here it goes these are mostly just names and titles without a whole lot of description but if you like some of these you'll probably like other ones because it means that our tastes are similar so yeah. patrick rothfuss he's my favorite fantasy author um his series that's called the king killer chronicle the first book in the series is name of the wind it's fantastic one of my favorite books ever one of my favorite series ever i don't remember what episode it was but we talked about this maybe it was the audiobooks episode where we talk a lot about how it is a completely different take on fantasy so i didn't read this for years and i wish i had and i'm rereading it slowly right now and listening to it slowly right now so you guys even if you're burned out on fantasy read it and if you love fantasy and haven't read it what is wrong with you 
read yeah, it. Yeah, and then uh, John Scalzi. John Scalzi is my favorite sci-fi author ever. Um, Hands his, down the best. His Yeah, I've read basically everything that he's written. Um, I would yep. recommend check out Old Man's War, which is a perfectly good standalone book, but it also has mm-hmm. an entire series behind it if you like it and you want more. But it stands alone just fine. You can read Old Man's War and move on and not feel like you're missing out. So Old Man's War is one of my very favorite science fiction books ever. Um, the other yep. one of his to check out is Lock In, which is a fascinating mm-hmm. look at like um, the near future having robots that can go out in the world for people who are disabled. It's very fascinating. Yep. Um, Brandon Sanderson is... Well, I actually want to say one thing oh, about Old Man's War. Um, with Old Man's War, it is about the... It's about recruiting elderly people into the military and sending them off into outer space that that's what made me read it in the first place was hearing about recruiting senior citizens and sending them into outer space as soldiers and that conceit made me read everything in that series that i just love it and it, it's character based again that the the premise is great but you want care the characters are awesome Yep. So Brandon Sanderson, he I know both yeah. of us have read most of his stuff. I've read I've almost read everything. Everything of his except for the Alcatraz books. Okay, I haven't read Alcatraz either, so we're in the exact same boat. But I'm gonna say Mistborn series is really good. The Emperor's Soul is my favorite thing of his. It's a it novella. Is brilliant. Yeah. Oh it, my goodness, it's brilliant. It's one of my favorite pieces of writing, especially by him. Um the Stormlight yeah. the Stormlight Archive, which starts with mm. the book called Way of Kings. Um it is epic fantasy but it's definitely a unique setting like we talked about before yeah and yep. it's my favorite the way of kings is probably my favorite of the sanderson books that i just absolutely adore it and i don't generally go into like the thousand to twelve hundred page fantasy novels because there's so much of an investment i am i am waiting just expectantly just anxiously just rocking back and forth give me the third one give me the third one give me the third one and then the the rhythmatist is really good it's it's really good it's a weird magic setting that's totally like an alternate i don't know if it's alternate history kind it's, of it's gear punk yeah it's, it's uh, like a it's weird that's i guess that's a good way to describe it like gear punk steampunk alternate history early mm-hmm. 1900s but with magic that's the best i can do in short form yeah with like battling like chalk, chalk drawings, drawings like pokemon yeah it's it's weird and young adult, but don't let that put you off. It's super cool. Yeah, it totally works. Um, Steelheart is another one that's fantastic. Uh-huh. It's superheroes. It's it is well, I guess no a superheroes. superhero novel, but the conceit is that anybody who gets superhero powers becomes corrupted by them and becomes a super villain. And yep. that's the premise for the whole book. And it's fantastic. There's three of them. The series is done now. It's really good. So Steelheart, yep. check that out. Legion is another good short story. There's a couple super short stories good. now. Yeah, and that's yep. kind of like um multiple personalities but all of them are very intelligent in different ways and he switches them out and talks to them as needed and uses them as a source of information and it's kind of like the matrix and being able to download whatever skills you need but it's with a set group of actual multiple personalities really yep. well done yep and then i'm gonna say don't read elantris that's the only book and of i his. disagree it's awesome that's the only book of his i'd ever did not enjoy it's very very slow and long-winded yes. and it's his first published book so i understand why but i don't yep. like it and people keep asking him to go back and revise it and he's just like no it's done i've got more stuff to write but i enjoyed elantris but you're absolutely right it is slower and more plotting and i would also like to talk about um warbreaker it's free oh, yeah. on his website. Warbreaker's good. Warbreaker is super cool. It's like the next series that we're going to talk about um, in that it uses colors as its magic system. And it's great. Like Warbreaker didn't get the attention that it deserves. And you can go onto Brandon Sanderson's website right now and download the ebooks in any format that you want, not having to pay for them. Uh, he worked it out with his publisher. Uh, so go download Warbreaker and it really is super good. It's one of the ones that I could not stop reading. Yeah, I forgot to add that to the list, but you're right. Warbreaker is really good. Okay, next up, Brent Weeks. Um, we talked about this a little yeah. bit last week with the Lightbringer series, the newest one, The Blood Mirror, mm-hmm. came out, and that's what I'm reading right now. But um, the first one is, is it The Blinding Knife or is it The Black Prism? Do you I remember? Think it, I, I can never remember. I think it's The Blinding Knife. It, you can Google while I talk. Um, yeah, well. So the Lightbringer series is basically it's another fantasy setting that is not tropey. 
um, it has magic users and they use their magic by it's called drafting colors so they have to look at something of the color that is associated with their magic and every different color has different magical properties associated with it and they're limited to what they can do with that color and so you get people who are very powerful that can draft multiple colors next to each other and then you get people that are super powerful that can maybe draft three colors that are all on the color spectrum close to each other and then you get people who are insane like the prism who kind of is one of the biggest leaders in the world who can draft every color with no consequences but one of the things about drafting is that when you draft to a certain point in your life you can only draft up to the point where like your eyes are full of that color and then Mm -hmm. the halos of your eyes like the irises will break open and the color will leach into you and become a color white and you basically go insane with the color of magic that you are and you're basically controlled and you basically become an elemental of that yeah where it's it's you are then trying to pull yourself and create as much of a an elemental like creature and golem out of yourself as you can it's like not self mutilation, but self enhancement through using that magic in the colors. Yeah, that it's really cool. It's and really the good. reason that this series exists is because someone dared weeks and said, "I bet you can't take Magic: The Gathering and make it into a series of novels." So it's based on using the five colors of magic and magic the gathering and there's even a card game inside the books that people use based on the colors that is it's super meta if you know about it and makes it even more enjoying enjoyable to me yep it's really good and you just you sent me a message it starts with the black prism so if you're interested in that the first book is the black prism go check that out um the other one by brent weeks is the night angel trilogy it's really good but it does start out very tropey and then it's very slow it does it starts out slow it starts out tropey and then it slowly reveals itself to be much more than it looks like in the first Mm -hmm. place but i don't really know how to sell it in short form it's almost epic fantasy with assassins and don't let that put you off i hate assassin fantasy like i hate it i hate it i hate it if someone says that this is assassin slash ninja fantasy i am turned off immediately and be like thanks but i'm gonna punch you in the throat for telling me that it is awful don't suggest that to me this is really good that this is the one exception to that that i've ever read and enjoyed that if you can get through around the first i don't know 50 to 100 pages which are very slow and i had to put up i put down and pick back up probably three times before i got to the point where i'm like oh oh this is awesome and then move forward like it is great i plowed through the rest of the series once i got past the initial slow tropey intro yeah but if you're interested in brett weeks start with lightbringer just because it's it's much better paced than Night yeah. Angel. I think it's a much better series, honestly, and I wish I I'd started too. with it. Yeah, yeah, probably. Um, Jim Butcher is, like I had mentioned mm. earlier, the Dresden series is one of the only like urban fantasy ones that I will actually read. Dresden is fantastic. I don't know. It's it's modern settings, but it has wizards. Wizards are real, and like basically mystical creatures are real. You know, a bunch of magic stuff is real, but yeah. The main character is Dresden, and he's this, like, I don't know. He doesn't want to interact with the wizarding world all that much because they don't like him. And he's kind of like a detective for hire, kind of, is where it starts. And then it goes off. Yeah, he's a private investigator. It's basically a detective series where instead of being a disgruntled police officer, it's a disgruntled wizard. Yep. Very noir. I like it. Yeah, and then um, another series of his that I read and enjoyed was Codex Alera, even though it's, yeah, I knew you would say that. It's it's much more tropey than anything else we talked about. Um, yeah. But if you don't mind tropey fiction, then Codex Alera. Cinder Spires is actually pretty good. That's his newest one. Have you read any of it yet? No, I have it. I have okay. it on audio and I have the ebook and I haven't read it at all. And given that I wrote a steampunk novel, I should read it because it's actually supposed to be from what I've heard, actually very similar to my novel. So uh, I need to read it and see. Mine came out first. I win. Yeah, I I guess the setting's not that different from your novels. The right. ones that you're talking about, the steampunk ones. Um but his take on it is very different but yeah it's oh yeah, yeah it's yeah, a yeah. steampunk setting done by jim butcher and the first book was decent it wasn't fantastic but it set it up so that the next books going forward look like they could be very interesting now oh, that great okay kind of the intros to all the characters have been done and like 
they've kind of been assembled into a crew by the end of the first book. Right. It, it's in a really good spot for book two to be great. So I'm, that's kind I'm of what Dresden the Files one. was too. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to say Rachel Kane, which I know you haven't read any of. I haven't. But the Weather Warden series is the other one that's kind of urban fantasy. I wouldn't even call it urban so much as like modern fantasy. And it has there there are people in the world called wardens and they can control one of like the three primary elements of the earth. So there's weather wardens, earth wardens and fire wardens. And there are rare people who can this sounds familiar to you, but they can control multiple different like um elements in that way right it, it's not people running amok wild it's basically like all of the people who are found to have these powers get brought into this organization that tries to just keep the earth in balance and that's kind of the premise for the whole thing so you get hired right like your full-time job is being a weather warden or an earth warden huh. and so if you're a weather warden they position you somewhere where weather can get kind of out of control like you know hurricane central or like florida yeah. or like tornado alley you know some something like that if you're an earth warden they'll put you on like fault lines to like make it so earthquakes aren't as bad and Makes they sense. hire you full-time that's your job for life you know if you want it um it starts there and then it starts to take off with more kind of fantasy elements that get added in people who become corrupt um things like like genies and jinn like oh, existing cool. they exist in the real world and they interact with the elements also so these things slowly become revealed but that's like the premise for weather warden that's really good and then the other one of hers that I really like is The Great Library, which I've talked about like three episodes in a row now. So Ink and Bone is the first one. Paper and Fire is the second one. I don't think I need yeah. to sell you on it again because I talked about it enough. I know you want to talk Stephen King. I'm a huge Stephen King fan, and I had almost avoided his stuff for a long time because I was like, eh, his movies are kind of bad. You know, I've heard a lot about it. And, eh. and then I read Stephen King. I had a friend give me The Gunslinger when I was in college, and I just fell in love with it. And I read the original unrevised version of it and loved it and it's a very it's kind of like reading the first night angel or reading elantris where it's like i see where this could go and be all right if it were done differently but then the rest of the dark tower series just just pulled me in and i became a stephen king fan for life i i have everything but his last few books in hardcover i i collect his stuff his short fiction is wonderful and it's I don't really get scared of Stephen King when it comes to his stuff. Like, horror fiction doesn't really scare me that much. But he writes about people so well. He understands people, and there are characters in all of his books that despite whatever the setting is, despite whatever the conceit and premise of the book is, I am loving or hating those characters enough that I'm invested in it. And so I will read almost anything that he does. Um, it just may be a few years from when I get to it, because after reading as much as I did for a long time, I kind of burned myself out on Stephen King. And now I'm getting to the point where I really want to read more of it because I've heard such good things about his newer stuff that he's doing right now. We got a ticket recently for when he when he came to Nashville at the Ryman Auditorium and we went and watched it and there were random signed books that you got. You paid for the ticket, you had, uh, you watched the talk and then as you left, you got a book and there was a random chance that they were signed, that one of them would be signed and of the four tickets that we had, three of them were signed by Stephen King of End of Watch and it's like we had crazy luck that night. So I've I've got all me and Jennifer and our friend Adam Adam got signed copies of the Stephen King, newest Stephen King book. So we were all, I was just jumping up and down, being, being me, just squealing, making a scene because I didn't think it was going to be as big a deal to me as it was. And then seeing it, I was like, yeah, this is a really big deal. <laughs> nice. And again, if you guys want to hear any more about any of these particular series or authors or our opinions, like we could probably do podcasts on every single one of the series we talked about and just dive in yeah. deep. Um, I don't know if I want to do that because that's a lot of work and that's basically a book club. But we have that. <laughs> yeah, we uh, maybe eventually a book club. We'll see. Um, but we do have that Q&A show just like Ask Us Anything style coming up later in November. So 
send us your questions, send them on Twitter to at geek to geekcast or send them on the subreddit. We have a thread where we're gathering them mm-hmm. all up. If you guys ask about any of these particular, we will answer because we like them. So you can do that if you want more information. Besides that, before we get on to weekly geek reading stuff, we haven't asked for a long time, but ratings and reviews on iTunes are still like yeah. the best thing you can do to help us grow the audience. They make a huge difference. And I know that there are many, many more of you out there than we have ratings and reviews. So if you can take a minute, just you, do, you can't just click on the podcast in the podcast app for some reason. You actually have to search for it as if you've never heard of us before and navigate yep. to it that way. But if you do that, leave us a star rating. Leave us a quick, it only has to be like a couple words, review if you want. Um, that would be amazing. We it would really be appreciate fantastic. it. Like I see every single review that shows up there, every rating, and I appreciate everyone. So thank yep. you. And I want to also ask, tell your friends. Uh, that's really one of the best ways that we've had to build the community around here is basically just bringing somebody in. So if there's something that we have talked about, share our podcast with them. Share the individual link. You can get links to the individual episodes uh, and show notes on uh, on Void's blog. And there's also on Stitcher specifically you can get individual links to the shows so please 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 tell your friends yeah that'd be awesome and then i know you have the offer of the week this week right yes absolutely uh this week i want to talk about loot crate uh even though i have never subscribed to loot crate myself i get a lot of the stuff from loot crate because i have friends who do and whenever they either get uh stuff that they can't use or don't want or they think would be cool for me and my wife or they you know they're doing it for a program and you know you can't give a deadpool whatever to an 11 year old we uh we've always inherited all of the geeky stuff and we have really enjoyed loot crate so if you guys want to get 10 percent off at loot crate and give it a try yourself and uh you know help us out and support the podcast you can go to try lootcratecom slash geek and use the promo code bridge 10 at checkout so that you can get 10 percent off and support us awesome. so try it get some stuff it's it's geeky stuff so you'll love it it is it fits us um so with that it's time for weekly geekery and if you don't know it's where we share what we've been geeking out about this week um why don't you go first um, well, the first thing I've been geeking out about is this new MacBook Pro that they just released. Um, I am so excited to get this. I bought it. Uh, I was waiting. I was watching the Apple event as it came on. I pretty much set my day around waiting on the new MacBook Pro to go on sale because my my Mac is 13 years or not 13 years old. Oh my goodness, it's a 13 inch, it's a 13 inch six year old MacBook Pro that is on its last legs. That I think the RAM is going out of it. The battery is dying and i got it on my first wedding anniversary so i am i am ready to upgrade especially with moving into a new career of web development and design i need way more screen real estate and honestly more power just to keep as many tabs and programs open that i'm using at the same time so at the end of november you're going to hear me really geeking out about this new space gray macbook pro that i have coming in that i'm just just waiting for and told my wife Life this morning that I was like, I wish they would hurry up and ship it because I'm dying for it. Um, other than that, uh, you know, waiting on that, just checking it all the time. Um, been playing Overwatch again. I've been playing for the Halloween event that ends today as of recording this, and I love the Halloween skins. If you guys didn't know, I love Halloween. Like, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. And my wife and I tend to go all out. We got married on Halloween. If there's a Halloween event in a video game, I am all about about it and so being able to get a demon hanzo skin a a possessed farah it was just it just makes me so happy my ghoul anna it's great um so i've been playing overwatch a lot and still being pretty terrible at it but learning how to snipe a bit uh actual sniping not just hiding in a corner and spamming shots like tracking people's heads like i'm trying to get better at that also quitting my job i quit my job today as of this recording is my first day of self slash unemployment yeah officially so it's like woo! i'm terrified um this is this is absolutely terrifying but it's awesome i'm no longer professor beach i'm just beach even though my twitter handle i've been trying to think whether or not i should change my twitter handle to not being professor beach anymore but um moving into like i said web development design and this week I have specifically been geeking out about R.L. Stein, um, the Goosebumps author, Fear Street, that guy, um, because the book festival that I'm working for now 
is going to get R.L. Stein in April. So I'm going to get R.L. Stein to sign my Goosebumps collection that I still have all of my Goosebump books from when I was a kid, from when I was a kid, that it's like 30 of the first 30 I think I bought. And I have the very first edition of Welcome to Dead House, the first printing, first edition of the first Goosebump book, Welcome to Dead House, wow. on my shelf in just about near mint condition. So I'm going to get him to sign it. And I'm so excited that he is going to be able to, that it still has the Walmart sticker on it from when I bought it, that it was $2.21 when <laughs> I bought it, that I am I am so excited to see R.L. Stein. Like, we have been working so hard for weeks to make sure that this, this has worked out well. We recorded this really stupid video that I'm going to record. I'm going to link in the show notes so that you guys can just see how dumb I look in a video, in a web video like this, that we made it as goofy as we could like R.L. Stein coming to my hometown and being a part of that and being part of that marketing has just been just been wonderful this week so that's what I've been geeking out hardcore about is getting him to, to sign my first edition first Goosebump book that's awesome I just for all of your geekery the only thing I'm worried about for you as a fellow developer um, that new MacBook Pro, it doesn't have an escape key and it, it doesn't yeah. have a whole lot of ports that you might be used to if you're yeah. using modern computers because they're really trying to push the USB-C and their their yeah. proprietary lightning stuff. Like I'm afraid you're going to have to buy like $100 worth of adapters to get it to just work where it should just work out of the box. But again, I, 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 I'm going to wait. You have to tell me about it yeah. when you get it and see how it works. But those are my concerns. So I'm not as worried about the escape key because a lot of the default touch, the touch bar has an escape button on it. So, and a cancel button that I've seen. So I'm hoping that it's, it's not being there isn't going to be as big a deal as it sounds like it could be. You and I've heard a lot of when people, you get it. some people are going to be remapping caps lock to, uh, to escape. So that may be an idea. Oh yeah, that might work too. That'd be kind of annoying, but I guess it would work. Yeah. Um, for me, for your weekly geekery, uh, I did early voting this year. So, Hey, if you are, a U.S. citizen and you haven't yet, like I said, I'm not going to get into partisan politics, but you should go vote because this is the last yes. episode that'll go live before Election Day. And you might even be listening to this on Election Day if you're listening on Tuesday, the 8th of November. Um, you should vote. It's kind of a civic duty, as I feel like that anyway. Even if you don't like the candidates, go in and write yourself in as president of the United States. I don't care. But just you should go vote seriously, especially because like yep. the, I know president's important, but really the thing that matters to you that's going to have the biggest impact are all of the down ballot races that are actually happening in yes. your state or even more importantly in your city like those are the ones that matter those are the ones you should google and actually do research for so you don't show up on election day and be like i've never heard of these people i don't know who to vote for yeah and that like you said that affects your daily life yeah yeah exactly so i actually my wife and i did um early voting just you can request well not now it's too late but you could request you know an absentee ballot and then you can either drop your ballot off physically or you can just mail it back in. So we tried that this year because we didn't want to deal with the craziness of Election Day. And yeah. it was awesome. Like it showed up. We opened up our ballots and then like our, our politics basically line up. My wife and I, surprise, surprise, right? Married couple. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But we sat down and we actually just spent like hours Googling all of these down ticket races and figuring out yeah. like like I, I would have had no idea in the election booth who I wanted on the school board. But you give me half yeah. an hour with Google, I can figure it out, right? And we did that for all kinds of things like county commissioner and like school board. And I think there were a couple elected officials like on the city level for our city. Mm -hmm. And these are the people who don't actually have like a party affiliation. So you're not able to just go, oh, I'd normally vote for X party. I'm just going to vote for that person because it won't yep. actually say it, right? It just has a name. So I think I'm going to do this from now on. Um, I have no stress about yep. election day because I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to be anywhere at a certain time. I don't have to like get in line and wait. Like I'm done, right? I, I did my part for early voting and I got to do it in the comfort of my own home. I got to spend time Googling it and researching it and talking it over with my wife. It was fantastic. So I geeked out about early voting this week, which sounds kind of <laughs> like extra geeky. <laughs> that's the, that may be the nerdiest thing that's happened on this show, but 
I'm right with you. We didn't early vote, but what Jennifer and I plan on doing is getting the, uh, we're going to look at the ballots, see who is on it for the local stuff and statewide stuff, and then do our research on it because we want to know, we've already voted for the city council, but there's a lot more coming up in terms of judges and the, like you said, different, you know, school board stuff that will affect us and our, our friends and family that, we want to know about so we're going to do our research this week that was that was honestly on our to-do list already yep yep so if you're a u.s citizen and you haven't voted go vote that's that's my political statement for the week that's all i'm going to say yeah um, usa besides that i i was playing uh civ 6 i picked that up because i've liked civilization 4 and 5 and now i like 6 it's good i'm i've never someone who's like done a deep dive into civ enough that I'm super pumped about the changes. It's more like, hey, they made changes. This game is still good. It's mostly just civilization, right. but that's not a bad thing. And like, I don't like it's one of those that it hasn't changed that much, but I don't mind and I don't regret spending the money on it. And I'm actively playing it a little bit every day and I like it. Like, have you played Civ at all? I get so bored with them. Oh, okay. It's, That's okay. That kind of game is like, I like them. They're fine. And I completely understand why other people like them, but after I play just a few minutes, I'm like, yep, this is the game. And then I go do something else. Yeah. So for those of you who have played Civilization before or are playing the new one, I've already done like four games, four games to completion. Uh, I didn't win all of them, but I did win a religious victory, which was cool. It's a new thing that they have in there that wasn't really in there before. And then I won a cultural victory, which behaves differently now because there's like tourism, which didn't used to exist. Those two were fun. Huh. I'll probably go for a science victory next. Um, a military victory is the most boring because you can do that better in other games that are more rts mm. and less civvy. Yeah. But I'll, I'll do that eventually too. But yeah, I mean, Civ, it's, it's good. It's a new Civ. If you like Civ 5 or Civ 4, you will probably like Civ six because i don't know i don't know what else to say it's civilization again but it's still good uh besides that i got a like i got a really really good run of gamefly games i know i didn't even talk about them last week i think because i got a bunch yeah. of games that i just turned around without liking all that much wasn't that They're interested stinky oh i don't like dwelling on games that don't have anything interesting or redeeming about them like yeah. i don't want to sit here and be negative but this week i yeah. got uncharted 4 i got attack on titan i got battlefield 1 i got titanfall 2 all within a couple days of each other so Un ah. <laughs> uncharted 4 i was super surprised that i liked it <laughs> because i I know. I, I know you've heard me complain about the other ones so i tried the uncharted collection and i've tried the games before at other people's houses and i just i could never get into the series something about four they finally got the good balance between story and the rest of what you're doing and the story hooked me and i'm invested now so that was the very yeah. first one i've probably churned through 45 games now since i signed up for gamefly like two months ago um because i do them so fast and this is the first one that I actually use that keep it button. So I own it now yep. for like, it was cheap too. It was like 20 bucks to keep it. You know, they mailed me the case and now I own it. My only, <laughs> my only physical PlayStation <laughs> 4 game that I own, everything else is digital. And I, I almost didn't use the keep it button because I don't really like physical media anymore, but it was so cheap that I was like, no, no, I should, I should just do this. And um, so I'm, I'm actively working through that one. I haven't beaten it yet. And then I played Attack on Titan, which if you like the anime, you'll probably like that game. It really recreates the story and like the action and the 3D movement and attacking these giants like the Titans. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. I only kept it for a couple days and sent it back because I didn't love it, but it was fascinating. So if you like Attack on Titan, you might want to take a look at it. And then the two that I loved this week were Battlefield 1 and Titanfall 2 for the single player campaign. Like I love a good first person shooter single player campaign, even though I don't really like first person shooter multiplayer that much, which is as a slight tangent. That's why Overwatch is so surprising to me because I, I love right. that multiplayer. But Battlefield 1 and Titanfall 2, both of them had really good single player campaigns. Um, I like the Battlefield 1 much more than Titanfall 2. But I think it just depends on what kind of setting you want. You know, I thought yeah. Battlefield 1, it captured the feel of some of World War One really well, even though it is not historically accurate. <laughs> like, oh, no, I don't know if you've looked much at the media for it. 
Have you? Not really at all. I've just heard people really like it is about the extent of what I've done because I don't really like first person shooters, specifically the single player campaigns. I do get bored on that way more than I do on multiplayer. And I've never liked a Battlefield or Call of Duty game. So I was just like, cool, this is out. I'm glad people like it. Yeah, if a first person shooter doesn't have a good single player campaign, then I'm just not even interested. Usually, like I said, Overwatch is the exception there. And then before that, Team Fortress 2. But right. Um, Like, I haven't enjoyed a Call of Duty for a long time because the single player campaigns were really weak, in my opinion. Um, And I know there are people who that's their game every year. They get it and they love the multiplayer and that's what they do. And that's fine. But that's not me. Like, I just don't like that kind of shooter multiplayer. But yeah, Titanfall 2, it's more Titanfall. But now there's a campaign associated with it. And it's cool to, like, become a pilot and get to interact with your Titan. And the campaign actually turned into a lot of, like, wall running and wall jumping and like platforming almost from a first person point of view like Hmm. the shooting wasn't difficult it was super easy in the campaign the tricky part was like moving around in interesting ways which was really fascinating to see so that was a really good campaign but i think i would have enjoyed it more if i played it first because battlefield one i had played right before it and battlefield one blew me away like they take these historical liberties, right? They basically take some of the technology that was like at the end of World War One, and um, they almost just bump it forward a few years. So it's almost like World War Two tech in some ways. And then they go back and they reapply it to the last years of World War One. So World War One did not have flamethrower troops as every fifth person you encounter, right? Huh. It didn't yeah. have like these giant battle blimps all over the place everywhere. It didn't have like... As far as I know, it did not have the amount of, like, planes that are in Battlefield 1. Like, there are liberties taken, but they try to grab the essence of World War 1 right. and actually apply it to the campaign. And it, it really, really worked for me for some reason. Like, I haven't been that impacted by a single-player campaign in a first-person shooter since, like, Modern Warfare, maybe, was the last one that blew me away. And right. I guess, I don't know if you have context because you don't even like nope. this genre. Modern Warfare was like revolutionary when that came out. Like that I've blew, heard so much about yeah. that, but I don't No, You're right. I have absolutely no context of it. Like Modern Warfare kind of like blew everyone away with, wow, this is what a first person shooter campaign can be like. And I haven't right. felt that blown away again until Battlefield 1 did it this week. Like it was. Do you think you're going to keep Battlefield then? Uh, No. Because I beat the campaign. The campaign is what oh. I wanted. Like, I love the campaign. And then I I spent... So I kept Titanfall 2 and Battlefield 1 for, like, uh, four days, maybe? Both of them okay. together. And um, after I beat the single-player campaigns, I tried to dive into multiplayer. And I still... I just don't like the multiplayer in those type of shooters. It's... I don't know. I get really bored really fast, you yeah. know? Now, it's I'm the same curious kind about of thing Titanfall 2. Because yeah. you did the beta and you hated it. Yeah. Like, I remember you being like, this is the worst. They changed everything I liked. I eh. And so with it, did they fix the the guns that you had such a major problem with in the beta? They like, what fixed, was it? They fixed a lot of the guns and a lot of the feel of moving around. So it's mm, much okay. better in the multiplayer now. But they did not bring back the smart pistol, which I loved from the first one. Um, right. I know a lot of people didn't like it, but I fell on the other side of that. I love the smart pistol because I like just moving around and like mopping up the grunts and stuff that they have in that game. But yeah, um, I guess I, so I'm kind of mixed on both of the games. Like the multiplayer is not for me, but the single player campaign was fantastic. And right. it, both of, well, I don't know if both of them feel this way, but I, I know Battlefield 1, it felt like if you had a dedicated gaming group that's going to be playing first person shooters every night and you know you can jump in a squad with them, that game could be amazing. Like it's set up right. to do small five player squads and you can spawn on each other and work together and it has different classes that like interlock in interesting ways. Um, yeah, that could be cool. It could be really cool. I just, I don't have those people and I don't have that scheduling yep. worked out. So it just, I don't know. It's just not for me. And I'm okay with that because I, I loved the single player campaign. I got what I wanted to out of it. And now I'm done. Yeah. With it. Yeah. I understand that. And I don't think I would get anything out of it other than just a few minutes of playing. Yeah. I, you just don't seem like the first person Mm-mm. shooter kind of guy. The other thing I want to talk about, which I almost talked about it a few different weeks in a row. When you get a physical copy, which I've been getting from these rentals from Gamefly, it, you have to install it on your yep. PS4. And it takes a long time 
Like very long time. Like I've gotten in the habit now that when I get one from GameFly, I turn on my PS4 and I pop it in the drive so that it'll start installing. And then I go do something else for like half an hour because sometimes it takes that long. It's, I don't know. It's just crazy for me. Like I'm used to PC gaming where I download a game from Steam and it installs in like a minute or I'm used to the PS4 games that I normally buy digitally where as soon as I've finished downloading it digitally, it's ready to go right like is it really oh yeah like why wouldn't because, it be once all well, the files the, are on there well on the playstation 3 you still have to do an install after you download something yeah no on ps4 you just as soon as it's downloaded it's just it's ready to go you can just awesome. jump in no waiting so having these physical discs that you have to actually wait to install them and like update and all that it's it's really a pain that i don't like i'm really glad that i'm mostly just digital media now totally understand because that was always a frustration for me and just wanting to play something i get a new game because i don't do digital on console generally uh mainly because of cost that i'll like wait on something to go on sale at gamestop or get a used copy and it's always super frustrating when i'm like yeah i want to play this and then it's like oh i have to wait because it's 1996 and i <laughs> I just have to, you know, go and do whatever I'm going to do. Like you said, I do something else while it's while it's installing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, hate it. It's also it's also kind of weird that uh, with Battlefield one, Titanfall two, and then the end of this week, Call of Duty Infinite Warfare is out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Infinite Warfare. That's the space one, right? Yeah. So like I said, I like a good first person shooter campaign. So I keep my eye on them, even though I usually don't buy them and keep them with the multiplayer thing. It's so weird that three weeks in a row are like all of the major FPSs for the year. It's like, yeah. why aren't these spaced out more? Why are they competing with each other so much? And I, I know the reason is they want to get out for, you know, Christmas season. Mm-hmm. But it feels like you should have pulled at least one of these out and put it in a different part of the year that was just empty, you know? like Yeah, because the middle... there was a drought for a good long time. Yeah, like summer is usually slow. Or sometimes like quarter one is slow, like into next year. I feel like they're all going to kind of cannibalize each other a little bit, you know, and they're not going to sell as well as they could. But yeah, especially because people, you know, may pick one because I know I've seen people talking on Twitter. I know I've talked to I think it was Scary Booster who was going through and talking about, well, Titanfall 2 and Battlefield 1 are out like I can't buy both of them that I have to pick and I'm going to pick Battlefield. And it's like, OK, I mean, that's a that's a major concern that I don't you're right. I don't understand the marketing or le- and release schedule for this. Yeah. If I wasn't renting these, I probably would have done the same thing. I would have looked at Battlefield one, Titanfall two and Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. And I would have looked at reviews to see which one had the best single player campaign. And I probably right. would have bought one of them this season and ignored the other two. But luckily, like I said, I'm in the middle of my Gamefly subscription, so I'm getting them all right when they come out. And then I can play the single yeah. player and just return it, which is perfect for me. But yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, you're going to buy one. You're not going to buy three of them. So I really wonder how that impacts the markets with each other. Yeah, we'll just have to look at the sales after a few months and really after the holidays and see what they did. Yeah. Cool. Well, that was a lot of random topics for Geekery. I love it. <laughs> I think I do too. I think that'll about do it for this week. Uh, don't forget, you can send us questions. We're still looking for questions for a Q&A yeah. episode in late November. Um, with that said, you can write to us with comments, suggestions, or feedback. Our email address is geek 2 geekcast at gmail.com or reach us on Twitter at geek 2 geekcast And uh, we have our longer discussion threads. Our subreddit is reddit.com slash r slash geek 2 geekcast and if you want to get email updates about any of our podcast networks, podcast, I don't know why I said that, you can sign up at geek 2 and tell us what shows you want updates about. I still blog almost daily at agreenmushroom.com, and you can find me at GRN Mushroom. That's Green Mushroom without the E's on Twitter. I'm on Twitter as at Professor Beege. That's Beege with two E's that I stole from his Green Mushroom. And I host the Geek Fitness Health Hacks podcast, and it comes live almost daily at geekfitness.net. And it is on all the social networks as at Geek Fitness Cast. We've been Void and Beege with your Geek to Geek podcast. That'll do it for this week. See you next week, geeks. Bye, geekies. Happy Hello Geek this week.